shout out to Steve Train. Real estate disrupt us. They cannot touch us. And yeah, we about to get Hey everybody, thank you for joining us for today's episode of Real Estate Disruptors. Today we have Dave Payerchin with Cell House Columbus. He flew in from Columbus, Ohio to talk about how he and RJ's company brings in six figures a month in rent. If this is your first time tuning in, I am Steve Trang, founder of the Offer Fast Homes app, the only MLS for off-market wholesale properties, and I'm on a mission to create 100 millionaires. One question I do get a lot is how do I become one of the 100 millionaires? So please allow me to answer it here. The information on this podcast alone is enough to help you become a millionaire in, in the next five to seven years. Take consistent action and you will become one. When you hear a nugget, please just type it into the comment section and after the show, identify your single biggest takeaway and just focus on that for the next seven days. If you get value today, please tag a friend below or share this episode right now. That way we can all grow together and this is a live show. So please ask your questions for Dave to answer. You ready? Let's go. All right. So first question is, yeah. What got you into real estate? What got me into real estate, so uh, just a, a bit about my background. It's actually very nostalgic, Steve, to be out here. In fact, yesterday, uh, my much better half and I were driving all around mm -hmm. Phoenix because I come from Cleveland. I was born and raised in Cleveland, but I actually, right after high school, I packed up and moved out here to do construction. So I packed up a tool belt, a drill, and a suitcase full of clothes, and I literally thought I was going to do construction out here in Arizona. And what year was this? 2001. Okay. All right. So that was well before the boom. But it was just getting started. So being a kid from Cleveland, I'd never seen, you know, just a field of Dell Web communities being constructed. Mm -hmm. It was insane, right? Yeah. So I had a little miracle in my life happened here in Arizona. And uh, I don't share this very often, but I didn't have a car. So I was rollerblading everywhere. Had a pair of rollerblades and I went to 24th Street in Camelback, you know, the Biltmore. Mm -hmm. How long have you been out here, Steve? I grew up here. I came here when I was a baby. Okay, so you remember, you know, the Biltmore. Of course. Do you remember the old coffee plantation that used to be there? It's something I, else now. Anyway. I remember Tower Plaza. I was rollerblading through here and I hear someone yell, Dave. So you know how it is. Every time you hear your name, mm -hmm. boom, you know, who, who was that? And then I'm like, wait a second. I don't know anyone out here. I look behind me. It was a girl that I sat next to in a keyboarding class who was an exchange student from Arizona right? What are yeah. the odds? In the first three months of me living here, and she's like, what are you doing here? And I'm like, I just moved here. I'm doing construction, and I'm looking for a second job. I want to make money. I've always been money motivated, mm -hmm. right? I've always been a collector or portfolio builder, if you will. I got a big sports card collection from when I was a kid. Um, but I said, yeah, I'm looking to make extra money. And she said, why don't you go to MCI Worldcom at 18th Street in Camelback? And they'll hire anyone. It was, I was a phone telemarketer. And I started the telemarketing gig. This was back in 01. And basically, soon, the telemarketing took over, the revenue from telemarketing took over my construction revenue. So I went full time into sales in 01. And uh, I wasn't even old enough to drink, Steve. So I would literally uh, just hang out at Borders Bookstore right there at the Biltmore, no longer in business, but I would just literally, I had no friends, wasn't old enough to drink, so I would go to bookstores and read books on sales. And if you've ever been to a bookstore, which I know you have, right next to every sales section is the real estate section. Mm -hmm. So being a kid from Cleveland with no money, you see a book, How to Retire Young and Retire Rich with Real Estate, I dove into the real estate. So I think like a lot of people, I got into real estate for the freedom, for the money, lifestyle, right? Mm -hmm. Especially as a 19, yeah, you know, started studying real estate when I was 19, 20 years old. Um, but I think anyone who says the money's not some reason why they start in real estate is, is pulling your leg a little oh, bit. Oh, they're lying to themselves. For sure. Or to you. Yeah. Uh, who wrote that book? It was a Kiyosaki, one of the- That was a Kiyosaki book? It was, it was, I think it was like from Sharon Lecter, like mm -hmm. one of his protégés or SCPA. power team people. Yeah. Um, but that was really what got me started on the journey. Got it. Okay, yeah. so you're 19, it's early 2000s. Yes. So you get the book, then what? I just dove into Tony Robbins, I dove into Kiyosaki books, and I just worked. So I just continued to work uh, in telemarketing because it's not like I just read a book and packed up and I'm full-time into real estate. Yeah. So I was living there. I didn't start in real estate till 05. So it was four years of telemarketing. Wow. And okay. four years of just studying. I bought Carlton Sheets course, but I witnessed something at a young age that totally changed my perspective. So do you even remember the company MCI WorldCom? 
Um, You've heard I, of them. I remember they were one of those companies that the, the accounting was highly suspect. For sure. Yes. The CEO, Bernie Ebers, he's probably, I think he passed away. In fact, I researched it recently. I think he went, they, they, they arrested him. And yes. then he got super sick right after they arrested him. Isn't that, isn't that funny how these energetic things work sometimes, yeah. too? Yeah. Um, that was right around the Enron scandal. Mm -hmm. All sorts of people were right cooking their books. Yeah. I walked into work one day at MCI, and I had no financial literacy at this point in my life. Mm -hmm. So I walk in one day, you know, my little brown bag of lunch and getting ready to make some sales. And uh, they're like, oh, we're closing. We're, we're out of business. So mm -hmm. I witnessed people in tears, people who worked there for 20 years. Their 401k got obliterated. Oh, yeah, it got decimated. Decimated. So. Yeah. I that just further reinforced. I'm like, okay, look, I cannot rely on a corporation um, to create freedom for myself. Everything I was reading in the books, it's mm -hmm. like now I'm witnessing in my in my own life. Yeah, it's kind of interesting because um, I think for a lot of people, it's kind of hard to take that idea of a corporate world is actually not safe. It feels safe, but it's not safe at all. Correct. And I was lucky working at Intel, sure, to watch all these people get laid off all the time. Yes. So it was like actually a blessing. <laughs> Yeah. To be hanging, to be at a company where people are getting laid off, because then we can pierce that false sense of stability. Yeah, man. So that's how I got started. I, I got to witness all this. And I was a kid from Cleveland, so I had a big ego. Like, I had a lot to prove. Mm -hmm. I'm the baby of my family. I'm the youngest of four children. Um, having older brothers and sisters, moving out at such a young age. It's like, I'm going to show everybody. Not to mention in high school, I never got good grades. I was voted class clown for the high school graduating <laughs> class. So was that was that like a good thing or a bad thing? Um, I mean, it is what it is, right? Um, but I just never, no one ever really had high expectations for me. Got it. I'll, I'll put it that way. And so I had a chip on my shoulder when I entered the business. And you know, and in in our business, you've been doing this a long time. You've also met and interviewed a tremendous amount of people. Mm -hmm. A lot of ego comes with this. It's like finally, I found something that I can create a small amount of success with. I'm going to prove to everybody. So I started off on the wrong foot, but I think a lot of people start in business or anything that way. It's that competitive attitude. Mm -hmm. um, but that's why I started, and I did the telemarketing for four years here in Arizona. And then one day, uh, it was May of 2005. I had fourteen thousand dollars saved up. And I put it all into direct mail campaigns, and I was full time into real estate. So. Put it all. Well, I just went for it. Yeah, I you mean, just, I was just. You just bet it all in black. I, I would for sure. No, I, yeah, I was handwriting envelopes, and um, I bought a list. I think I got a list from a title company, Camelback mm -hmm. Title. They're probably not even in business anymore. I, I haven't heard of their name in a long time. Doesn't matter. Yeah. Um, but that's what I did. I got a list, and I started stuffing envelopes and writing out handwritten envelopes, and I got my first two deals off of Fillmore. Off of Van Buren. Mm -hmm. You familiar with that area? Of course, I'm familiar with Van Buren. That we grew up here. Well, <laughs> that area has come up a lot. So the hookers actually have teeth now on, on Van Buren. <laughs> I've noticed since they put the light rail in, the, the bar's been raised. But I got uh, I got my first two deals. I just remember being nervous as hell. And yeah. then it was off to the races. But the year was 2005. What was going on in the real estate market in 05? It was a crazy run up. Crazy run up. Why? Uh, I, I'm convinced it's because of rich dad, poor dad. Well, no, a lot of that's probably has to do with a lot of it. In fact, my business partner, RJ Papino, that's how he got his start was Kiyosaki. Mm -hmm. It's a lot to be said about that. Guy changed a lot of people's lives, but yeah. uh, it was because they were giving money away oh, so yeah. loosely. That yeah. was really the catalyst that drove ninja loans. Ninja loans. So everybody and their brother was buying houses. Mm -hmm. So therefore, me as a wholesaler, I was driving for dollars and I would track down the owner and I was. I made $180,000 in my first fiscal 12 months of doing real estate full time. Wow. And I was 23 at the time, 23, 24. Felt a little invincible. Felt a, a lot invincible. And you give, you know, that amount of money to somebody who has zero financial literacy. Mm -hmm. It's like pulling the pin out of a hand grenade and handing it to them. Yeah. So I bought a uh, no, what is it? A uh, Mustang. I got an Audi. I drove by my old house. They leveled the old house, actually. It was off Piccadilly Road and 49th Street. I can see Camelback Mountain. Mm -hmm. I had no business owning these homes. Countrywide mortgages. I was walking into Washington Mutual, pulling out third mortgages against houses. <laughs> it was a nightmare. And the biggest lesson that came from that is debt is not income, mm -hmm. right? These are loans that need to be paid back. So needless to say, in 07, I was completely belly up. I went bankrupt. And then I started waiting tables at 44th Street and Thomas uh, Applebee's. So before we get into that, sure. I think going back to what I was saying earlier about Rich Dad Poor Dad, yeah. he did push very much that there is good debt and bad debt, and and, and this it, is true. And yeah. that's why I kind of say like people were over leveraged because that book taught them to be over leveraged. Yeah. Um, but 
what I want to ask you is, sure, your eyes were open in 2001. And then you didn't really do anything until you got basically stomach punched, right, by MCI. Yeah. So, yeah. and the reason why I want to bring this up, because there's a lot of people, and you see this. Sure. Like they're watching YouTube, they're reading the books, they're listening to the podcast, and they just don't have that in them to just take that first step. Yeah. So, do you want to talk about that at all? Sure. Yeah. I mean, if I could do it all over again, mm -hmm. I would have absolutely not tried to been a lone ranger and just that's that ego, right? Mm -hmm. In trying to do everything myself. So when I first started out, I left MCI and then I continued my telemarketing career at a different company, not even in business anymore. Um, was, okay, let's call it what it is. Boiler rooms. I was born in the boiler room. I also cut my teeth in the boiler room. Okay. So, yeah. Well, we're, we're of the same kin here. Then. Yeah. Um, but I continued my telemarketing and I tried to do everything myself. So I started going to RIA meetings. I would uh, cut out of work early just to go to a RIA meeting. And I thought everyone was my competition, mm -hmm. right? And I, having a mentor, I don't want a mentor. I'm going to figure it all out myself. It's, it's not, not worth, worth paying them. It's not worth paying them. I'm not going to, I'm going to do this all myself. I'm not, I, I wouldn't share with anyone. Mm -hmm. I didn't play nice in the sandbox in the early years. And that is, that's actually the number one thing that inhibited my growth didn't contribute to it. Yeah. So any words of advice as far as taking action? Yeah. So people listening. Okay. Um, start where you're at. So, you know, if you are just getting started and you're on a shoestring budget, call it for what it is. Just be authentic about where you're at. Mm -hmm. um, maximize the resources that are right under your nose, right? A lot of times people think they have to reach for something new and the next best course and this and that. Most people watching this podcast, you probably could get enough value just from this podcast, which is yeah. free to take some type of action and even a small action um, is action and do something every day. I know it sounds so cliche, right? It's um, very cliche, but it's not wrong. I would tell you this. So if I was just getting started and I can talk to my 21 year old self or however old I was and uh, 23 is actually when I started, but mm -hmm. I would say, look, find a mentor and add as much value to somebody who aligns in your core values and has or is doing what you want to do. But the core values thing is big because if you don't see eye to eye and don't gravitate and, and uh, if you're not on the same frequency with somebody, it's not going to be a fit. Mm -hmm. But find somebody who does what you want or has what you want and figure out how you can add as much free value to that person as you possibly can. Yeah. Work for free when you're first getting started. Yep, absolutely. Okay, so you had this meteoric rise, <laughs> just <laughs> destroyed it coming out of the gate. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. then... You get humbled. Oh, yeah. Reality has a way of humbling you. Brother, I'm the youngest person you've ever met. I guarantee I'm the youngest person you've ever had on the show who had an IRS deposition sitting there with a recorded two IRS agents. I didn't know you had to pay taxes. No one told me that. You make a bunch of money and you just, you're, I'm a businessman, right? I mean, yeah. I, I, so I, uh, I had a lot of rude awakenings in my, in my short career. What was the IRS deposition? I didn't pay taxes for like three years. Right. I had over, I think, $70,000 in back taxes. Got and it. they interviewed me and they're like, what are you doing? And I think after I left the interview, both the people just felt bad for me. They're like, the guy has no clue what he's doing. Yeah. He's not some guy, he's some crook who's trying to like <laughs> dodge the IRS. So I got on a payment plan and licked my wounds over mm -hmm. the years, you know, and we all make mistakes. But you're talking about losing everything you lost everything and then your serving tables I went, like, well, absolutely i went chapter 7 bk with seventy thousand dollars worth of tax liens on my back but where were you i mean because like you, you hear these numbers right like you know i was a millionaire right and then we lost everything like what how high did you go before you crashed i had i think um not even a i just I didn't have a lot of houses. Mm -hmm. I was borrowing from private lenders, okay, and buying houses and then refining it out. I was, but I was refining, I was way over leveraged. So I was basically, I think I only had like at the, that I lost in mm -hmm. foreclosure about five homes. Now, yeah. and it doesn't sound like a lot, but the amount of debt that I carried on these five homes was astronomical. And I will make this point. Yes, I went chapter seven BK. Um, yes, I did previously have a lot of tax liens and things of that nature. And yes, uh, I borrowed a lot from private lenders. I've paid back every single dime of private money that I've ever raised. Mm -hmm. um, I've never not paid someone back and uh, worked it all out with the IRS. So I'm okay there too. Yeah, that's huge because there are yeah. people that don't understand. Yeah. Or I don't know. I think maybe they're just soulless, right? Like they'll take people's money for private money. Yeah. 
and like think of like treat them like a like a corporate lender like no like that's someone's family it's more important it's the yeah. most important yeah the, well the corporations can write it off and get bailed out right crony capitalism is going to save uncle them. sam will bail out the corporations absolutely unfortunately it's but it's disgusting to me but to the, the private, private money, people and we to this day yeah. you know we've raised over 20 million dollars in private capital we have a lot of private capital working on the street mm. every our lenders will eat before we eat absolutely and that's the motto of the company that should be the model for everybody. It should be. In this business. All right. So you're serving tables. Yes. How did we go from serving tables to where we are today? So serving tables, and then I wasn't sure what I wanted to do, so I wanted to get into philanthropy, and that's what I did. I moved to California for a little while, and I was working with a nonprofit organization that built schools in Guatemala. So I was like, okay, I get to travel a little bit. I don't have a pot to piss in. I don't know what the language uh, thing is on your podcast here, so I'll keep it. But it's the truth. Mm -hmm. um, I had nothing to my name, and I decided I'm just going to travel the world and live on the beach and do San Diego and this and that. And then I got the opportunity to work for a, uh, a real estate education company. And that real estate education company was realestateinvestor.com. Mm -hmm. And I'll give a big shout out to uh, Colin Andrews Egbert and Matt Lights. They were the co-owners of realestateinvestor.com. And they gave me an opportunity to be their back of the room sales guy. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was pretty cool opportunity because I, I had the real estate experience. My heart was always in real estate of all the work that I had put into myself. And, uh, and then I also got to do sales and it was a pretty loose schedule and that worked for me being uh, a young guy in California. I had a lot of fun out there. Yeah, And then uh, I was working one of their seminars in San Diego, where I was living, and uh, Preston Ely was having a Freedom Soft uh, event there. And they brought this guy, this nervous Filipino guy, up to the uh, front of the room to talk about his experience. And he was, uh, first words out of his mouth were, you know, I, I live in Columbus, Ohio. So I was like, hey, I'm an Ohio guy. I live out here now. But mm -hmm. uh, that person was RJ Papino. Mm -hmm. And then we linked up later in the day. We were, both of us were just hanging out, drinking and smoking and being, you know, people in our 20s. Being young kids. Being young kids. And, mm -hmm. uh, and we stayed friends. And then we stayed friends for years. So I met RJ through working for realestateinvestor.com. And we met at a seminar that he was a testimonial for the product they were selling. Got it. And we stayed friends for years and we started buying. So I learned from my experience here in Arizona, I learned what speculation is. And I learned I didn't want to be a speculator. Mm -hmm. What is speculation for your viewers and listeners? Speculation is things will just keep going up. Right. Right? The party will never end. The party will never end. Well, the party ends bad, you know? And uh, it always does. It always shows up with the cops. <laughs> <laughs> so I learned I didn't want to be a speculator, started buying cash flow properties with mm -hmm. RJ in 2012. And, and that's where yeah. we're at. So then uh, you reconnected. What year was that again? We connected, I want to say, probably in 2009. 2009. Okay, so yeah. from 2009 till now, you guys have just been steadily building your portfolio. Well, no, 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 no. We we started buying together in 2012. I met RJ in 2009, and we Got were it. just buddies. And I was still living out west, and then we started buying homes mm -hmm. uh, in Columbus in 2012. And then I made the plunge and moved back to Ohio, moved to Columbus in 2013. Got it. We already had about 12 rentals when I first came back. Okay. Yeah. So something that I'm always harping on and I get flack for always harping on about it. But I always say, you know, partnerships are just one of those things that it, it's difficult, sure. right? Um, it can be good. Sure. It can be bad. Yeah. Um, and you know, you, you share with me that you guys have worked together for years. Okay. So it's official. We're not dating anymore. It's official. Yeah. So you want to talk about, cause you made a comment to me about, um, who knows how many companies have never had a chance Brother. because the partnership died before it started. Mm -hmm. Can you elaborate on that? Without a doubt, the reason RJ and I have, uh, well, core values is everything. Here's another cliche statement. We'll get this out of the way. It's the absolute truth, though. Mm -hmm. Core values, like, you can't always change what happens in a real estate market. Let's just stick, stick to real estate, right? Yeah. Interest rates can change, right? Loan products can change. Values and prices fluctuate. This is like a market. There's a lot you cannot control, but what you can control is, like, who you are. And RJ and I have the same core values. We're both hardworking guys. His uh, parents immigrated from the Philippines. And RJ is just a no-nonsense kind of guy. That's just how he is. He wakes up and gets it done. He holds me accountable for a lot of things. I would never be on the level that I am without a great business partner. Mm -hmm. But like we were talking about earlier, many partnerships never make it off the ground. Why? 
well, uh, ego has a lot to do with that. I, you, you heard my story. When I was first starting out, I didn't want to partner with anyone. I was a lone wolf mentality. And you kind of knew everything, kind of want to protect your notes. Of course. Oh, yeah, this is all mine. I'm, I'm going to be the best. My yeah. first, You want to hear a funny statistic? My first LLC that I ever set up, Professional Home Buyers of America LLC. <laughs> I'm taking over the country, Steve. I was a driven guy. But the reason is crazy, right? So when first starting out, there is an element of ego. Mm -hmm. And I had to grow out of that and lick my wounds. I would not be a good business partner unless I had been through some trials and tribulations. Same with RJ. He'll tell you the same thing. He's been through previous partnerships as well that didn't work. Yeah. It's like a marriage, right? I mean, you got to sometimes go through some relationships that don't work. Um, but RJ and I have the same core values. We're both hardworking individuals. And every single role within our company, we've both done and mm -hmm. I'll tell you what partnerships and tell me if you agree or if you've seen this in your own experience or the viewers at home um, the partnerships that tend to not work out Steve are the ones where one guy says I'm gonna bring all the money and the other guy says I'm gonna be the boots on the ground mm -hmm. because if that's the partnership and we're gonna build this portfolio together the guy who's the boots on the ground is always gonna feel shortchanged yeah it is so much harder feels to... like he doesn't get access to the upside well it's I mean the guy who with the money why do I need to partner with you to build this portfolio why not just partner one off with private lenders mm -hmm. borrow debt instead of giving equity of the entire thing that I'm doing all the work all the hiring all the marketing all the sales negotiation right with the sellers the guy with the money you know is just literally why not instead of giving away half of your portfolio and equity to this mm. person who's going to be your partner and fund you make yeah. them a lender and stick to the route of debt rather than equity right Does that make sense oh absolutely yeah so a lot of partnerships fail i think because of the ego and um and just bad uh bad terms right on the whole money and boots on the ground thing i just don't feel is a good arrangement yeah so, but is there any other things that you've seen? Like, cause you know, I thought it was an interesting statement that, you know, how many partnerships have we not, or how many businesses have we not seen or partnerships died? Have you, are there things that you, you could tell the listeners like, hey, don't do this in a partnership? There's always going to be, see, when it comes to a partnership, there, RJ and I have a, uh, a phrase, we say the hardest ship to sail mm -hmm. is a partnership because you cannot control circumstances and things are always moving. Sometimes one partner in this arrangement has breakthroughs faster than another partner. Sometimes one partner is, elevates on a different speed than the other partner. Mm -hmm. And you have to be able to live with that and then still have the trust of not being a thief and stealing, right? right? But what sometimes, you know, through the years, sometimes I gotta pick RJ up a lot of times he's got to pick me up to have that grace with your partner i feel is a very uh important thing yeah um so when the time comes when maybe you have had a breakthrough or you make a contact like holy crap this person i just met this guy i made the contact you know um look at the partnership if you're really all in as one entity we made this contact just right. because i met the guy in the hallway who's now going to fund you know 10 million dollars worth of our deals um, we've always been very good about we, not me, but mm -hmm. we've also both pulled our weight to the best of our ability and done every single role in the company. Neither one of us have ever been too good to do anything from collecting rent to knocking on a door. We've done it together, everything. Yeah. And I think there's something there yeah. that's kind of un, uh, um, under, right? That's implied what, what, what you're talking about is that you're both intentional. Yes. You're both intentional in making this partnership work. Yeah. Right. And it's just like a marriage. If only one side is trying, it's not going to last very long. And you know what? We, and RJ's married. He's got a, a lovely bride, mm -hmm. Lindy. And, you know, Lindy has... RJ and I, or when we were start, RJ was with Lindy dating mm -hmm. before RJ and I even got together. Yeah. So she, I mean, was trying to build a relationship with this man. They're now married with a beautiful baby. That's why I can't be here right now. Mm -hmm. Baby Leone is at home right now. Um, but Lindy's put up with it, too. She's been trying to build a relationship with this guy, right, RJ. And RJ is trying to build a business with this guy. Mm -hmm. So we've all three of us have had this dynamic through the years, but we've all stuck it out and it, it pays off. You got to stick it out a little bit too. Yeah. Right? So at some point you guys partnered up around 2012. Yeah. Uh, one of the things we talked about was you, you guys have been involved in hundreds. I think I was looking at over a thousand flips. Sure. And you guys also have this hundred plus property portfolio. Which one you want to talk? Which one started first or the other? You know what? So RJ and I collectively, we have done over a thousand flips. So if you're counting all the wholesales, all the every turnkey, I mean, we've sold 
hundreds of turnkey properties. And this is going back to 05 when I started, right? Mm. I mean, counting all that, but that's not what excites me, unfortunately. And you do a lot of these podcasts. Mm. The thing to talk about is flipping and wholesaling. Look at it. every single TV show out there is flip this house or, you know, house right. hunters and the whole deal. You know what's exciting to me is the buy and hold, man. And I would really love the opportunity to have your listeners and viewers walk away after today's podcast saying, you know what? Buy and hold is kind of sexy because yeah. well, it really is. Well, that's the reason why we got into this. Without a doubt. Right? Like we got into it for the money. Just, yeah. You know, we were addressing that. Keep it real. Right? Yeah. But then also part of that financial freedom and time freedom is buy and hold so that you can do whatever you want, whenever you so want. So important. So let's talk about, you know, how did you get to a hundred property portfolio? Sure. Well, it goes back to the integrity piece and the core values piece of always paying your private lenders, right? Mm -hmm. And we started our portfolio with a very expensive money, but you got to pay to play. And that's why when people are first starting out, um, you know, we were paying uh, a double digit interest rate plus giving up 50% of the portfolio when we were first starting. How do we think I know about the whole, the <laughs> give away half your portfolio? Yeah. We worked for free a lot. Yeah. Um, but when we first started, we were borrowing uh, from some private lenders, ex extremely expensive. Yeah. And we had to earn our stripes and we were buying in the C-class areas um, because if you're gonna cash flow 12% money, which we needed to do, mm -hmm. You better have a low cost basis, right? Yeah. You're all in, meaning purchase and rehab better be pretty low or you're not going to be able to cash flow houses. So we started in pretty much the roughest parts of the city of Columbus where mm -hmm. you can, uh, that you'll find. And we would be, our program when we were first getting started was we want to be all in, meaning purchase and rehab for 25000 or less. You can't even buy, build a garage for that. I understand. <laughs> Um, but that's what we would do. And we would borrow 12% money mm -hmm. on a five year amortization. And I got those terms from Joe Lieber, who we call Uncle Joe up in Cleveland. Have you ever met Joe? Mm -mm. He'd be a great guy to have on the show. Yeah. Shout out to him. But so I can tell you right now what the payment is on 25,000, five year, 12% uh, money. It's 556,011. Yeah. Might be 56611. So punch it into your calculators here, everybody. Your financial calculator's 56611. But I know that memorized it because we've done so many of these deals. So early on, Steve, we're buying the houses in the worst part of town mm -hmm. with the most expensive money you can get your hands on, barely cash flowing because we're only renting these things for seven or 750. We still got to pay taxes and insurance. But what, what were we doing is just hammering down the debt. Yeah. We're just hammering down the debt because it's only a five year note, right? So we're paying off so much principal. Uh, we still own some of these houses. We've refinanced them, um, you know, obviously, or or their own free and clear. How now. did you hammer down the debt? By just paying the payment, because okay. the uh, you know a five year note, there's a lot of principal being paid with every mm -hmm. one of those five hundred and fifty six dollar payments. Um, so it was a five year AM, not a five year balloon. Five year, five year AM. AM. It was not interest only. Yeah. Five year AM. We didn't understand things then. Man, like five year we amortization know. is aggressive. Aggressive. <laughs> You know yeah. what? But we were broke. We were extremely broke. So we had to wholesale, going back, circling back around. Hey, wholesaling is not sexy. Well, it is sexy, right? Mm -hmm. It's essential when you're building a portfolio. Yeah. You have to keep the lights on. We learned that. And actually, it wasn't as easy to wholesale in 2012 and 13 as it is right now. I mean, there's mm -hmm. zero uh, you know, supply out there for the high demand. But what we were doing then is we would be hammering down this debt with a small portfolio we continued to build. And instead of wholesaling properties, we were selling turnkey properties. So we mm -hmm. built a whole turnkey business, uh, Columbus Turnkey, have great people who have helped us along the way, but that's what we would do. We would borrow now private money, interest only money, new money, um, and even that was 10 and two. And we would fix up houses and then sell them to out-of-state investors and other places. And we did a ton of good business. I mean, we have serviced, you know, hundreds of investors and and uh, helped them build portfolios because they live in high-dollar markets like Phoenix or right. California, but they want to start building a portfolio. So we were the supply, and that was our flipping business while we built the portfolio. So turnkey was uh, how you were generating income. Correct. While you're trying to acquire rental properties. Correct. Got it. And yep. And in, in doing the the, uh, the turnkey, I mean, just for these people that are listening, what is an example of, um, you know, just doing one turnkey at that time? What was the cost? What did you walk away with? Sure. Well, I can tell you all the reasons to not get in the turnkey business, and I'll, I'll touch on that mm -hmm. because it always feels like 
you know, you're doing deals and making money, but at the end of the day, you have no money. And an average deal would be, we were all in for 60K and meaning purchase and rehab. And then we would turn around and sell it because it was all fixed up and rented out to a conventional buyer. So they would come in with for like 80 or 85 mm -hmm. and they would come in, you know, with their loan and then essentially, you know, in theory gross, we're making around 20 or 25, right? Mm -hmm. But the thing is with the turnkey business is you're dealing with conventional buyers who are gonna, you know, you gotta meet the appraiser's needs. You're like, you're dealing with these people who uh, are using conventional money. It's much, there's so many more hoops to jump through is what right. I'm getting at. It's so much easier just to wholesale. If you were just starting out, I would say, don't even really get into the turnkey business. If you're buying a house and fixing it up and getting it rented, keep it. I mean, right. so many of these houses, I wish we would have kept them all. Um, it's just some, such a better model to wholesale if you're flipping properties mm -hmm. than to do the rehab. Where's the risk come into play? So in any Holding real estate- the property. Well, yeah, I mean, you, you raise the private money, there's risk. You're fixing the property up, risk. You're getting the property rented for somebody else, risk. Mm -hmm. There's laws and whatnot. Yeah. Um, so you're taking all this risk and then maybe you gross 20K, but that's highly taxed. That's earned income at the end of the day. Yeah. That's you know short-term capital gains. You're, you're paying tax through the nose. And there's also the time component. Like, time. That's the reason Opportunity why. Opportunity like, cost, brother. That's the reason why I'd rather make 10 in a wholesale Amen. than 20 on a flip. And we didn't know that until, you know, until and we do now. We learned a lot of lessons, but that's what got us good at buying properties, getting them fixed up, getting them rented out. So now we're at a place where we can just do it for ourselves. Yeah. So uh, it's funny. I I know your name was brought up to me a long time ago. I was trying to say, you know, who should we get on? Uh, but I didn't really know who you were until we joined CG because you're the one that's doing the, what was it, the, the, the charitable arm? What is it? The generous genius. Generous genius. Absolutely. So for those of you guys listening, that is how we connected. Yeah. Um, and so I, I heard you ranting on a Facebook Live. Recently? Uh, yeah, about how single family is where it's at. Okay, here we go. Here we <laughs> talk, go. Talk about it. Well, Keep in mind that we've had Rod on the show. Okay, and Rod's Tim, great. And, yeah. Tim, and Tim's coming at some point. I think it may be in April, so okay. just set the ground. <laughs> okay, so what you're referring to is Mr. Alex Pardo's podcast, yep. where he did a debate. We were just got out of a crazy political time mm -hmm. um and so we thought was it crazy we, no not at all it seemed pretty mild yeah pretty mild right <laughs> still going on unfortunately it's so negative it is right um but mr alex pardo who has another podcast mm -hmm. the flip empire podcast and he said hey i really want to do this debate single family versus multifamily in fact i think i started it because i went on a facebook rant all That's about what i remember calling out <laughs> tim brats mm -hmm. tim brats is my friend let's start let's start right here um, I just, I, you know what? We were coming out of quarantine, Steve. We were coming out. It's, it's time to ruffle some feathers and have a little fun is what we were doing. But, right. you know, I'm, I'm a big advocate of single family. But let me start here that first off, Tim and Rod are two phenomenal multifamily investors. In fact, if you're going to learn multifamily, you got to learn from people who do it right because mm -hmm. there's so many crappy syndicators and so many crappy people teaching this that I wouldn't yeah. touch with a 40 foot pole. Tim and Rod got their stuff together. Tim has had my back. He's a Cleveland guy. I'm a Cleveland guy. Um, I've been to the Bratz Manor up in Cleveland. I've taken training from Tim. So mm -hmm. he's somebody I highly respect and, and really like, as a genuinely like as a person. Um, so I was just having a little fun and I was taking the position. I'm Rocky, he's the big Russian because he is a quite a uh, sizable portfolio. But I, yeah. I think I made a lot of valid points on why, you know, building a single family portfolio is actually much better than building a multifamily portfolio. We had a lot of fun with it. Mm -hmm. They made a lot of great points as well. And at the end of the day, what we all determined, because look, RJ and I, we're not opposed to multifamily. Mm -hmm. We're all in the cash flow business and you can generate massive cash flow from commercial. And we own apartments right now. We have some apartments too. So yeah. I'm not fully opposed to it, um, but I think some pretty good points were made on the, on the position of single family over multi. Sure, yeah. so what is your argument? Well, I mean, if we started with acquisitions, well, let's start with the my opposition's argument first, mm -hmm. which they will wipe the floor with us, is scalability, mm -hmm. without a doubt. It is much you know, more scalable to buy a 100-unit apartment building than buying one house one off at a time. You, you, I will not argue that, and that's mm -hmm. where we started this thing, yeah. and that's where we ended it. However, when you're first getting started, 
um, and you're building a single family portfolio, or even if you're not getting single, uh, just getting started, there's so many more creative ways and so much better terms on money that you can do when acquiring a single family house. You can take it subject to owner financing. You can create way better terms. And uh, when you're buying an apartment building, the investor, they're an investor, they're savvy. Mm -hmm. They're not going to give you the same terms as Joe lunchbox, Joe homeowner who just right. wants done with this house. So, you know, on a smaller level, they've got the scalability thing. That's, that's out the window now. Okay. Mm -hmm. I gave that up. So now but there's way better ways to acquire single family homes than multifamily. And your private lenders, if you're raising private capital, are in a much safer position if they're lending you money and they get a first position note and mortgage or deed of trust against mm -hmm. your asset, it's far safer than putting their money into syndication. What if things go array with the multifamily operator? They're gonna have a hell of a time getting their money out. So it's much safer play for your private lenders. Uh, you can easily diversify so much better, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, and here's the here's the icing on the cake, which you know we can just end it here. Think, of the, think about the demand factor. In any business, Steve, right? There's a supply and a demand. I don't sure. care if it's a lemonade stand. If you have the shiniest lemonade stand on the block, but no one has a demand for your product, you're not gonna make any sales, right? Mm -hmm. Everybody wants to be in single family right now. Could you imagine being on quarantine, you gotta homeschool your kids, and you're working from home, and you're living in a dingy apartment? The only reason that people want to or live in an apartment is typically because you know, they have to. Mm. Now, granted, there's great things where you don't have to deal with the maintenance and things like that, but we are seeing a massive demand from people fleeing apartments right now. Right. And they all want the space, right? They want the space. They want to be, the crime is higher in these mm. apartment communities. Now, I know, granted, my opposition, Tim and Rod, they do a great job. I've seen Tim's properties. I've walked properties with Tim, mm -hmm. okay? Um, but not everybody operates it on a high level, right? Yeah. And a lot of these guys are in the multifamily business and they shouldn't be. Mm -hmm. And it's a, their tenants desire to be there is a reflection of poor management and operations. And they all want to hightail out of there and move into single family. The demand for single family has never been higher. In fact, the big money, Wall Street money is fleeing in. Look at invitation homes, right? right. Um, American homes for rent. They're building thousands of homes, right? Single family homes. Built to rent. Build or rent is, yeah. is massive. Yeah, that's, it's not that's going an anywhere. Yeah. It's an interesting shift the last couple of years. The rents build to rent are model. going up for single family. Rents are not going up at the same rate in multifamily. So I'm sure you guys address this, but enlighten me. Bonus depreciation. Sure. Isn't that better off in multifamily versus single family or you not better it's the same you can do the same stuff you know we we do it as well i mean any operator in multifamily sure the depreciation is phenomenal you can mm. do the same stuff with uh with single a portfolio of single family homes as well and one yeah. of the arguments that uh the opposition made was oh well what about the you know uh the financing you know it's not even going to show up the um, non-recourse financing. Well, you could get non-recourse financing on a portfolio of homes too. Right. So pretty much, oh, here's another big factor. The reason I feel that single family investing is really more desirable than a multifamily uh, property is the exit strategies. I don't know if you own rentals. I know you've met a lot of people who own rentals. Anyone building a portfolio will tell you that when building a portfolio, sometimes you got to pair off properties. You got to free up cash flow, man. This mm -hmm. isn't, uh, you know, just, uh, you know, a walk in the park, right? right. How are you going to pair off an apartment? What are you going to do? A converted? And so having the separate parcels mm -hmm. and the multiple exit strategies is very favorable when building a single family portfolio. Think about the exit strategies. You can sell it on terms mm -hmm. like a land contract or owner financing. You can do a rent to own. You can give an option to buy, yeah. defer the maintenance to the tenant, right? You can sell it wholesale. You can sell it to a tenant, help them get an FHA loan. Right. So when creating cash flow and building a portfolio, there's you know having single family houses and multiple exit strategies, uh, second to none. So it's the flexibility. Flexibility. Yeah. And then um, you also made the comment um, that leverage is a good thing. So we kind of talked about you know we kind of got back and forth. Um, I was saying that Kiyosaki highly encouraged debt. Sure. Right. And then uh, you know the banks. Yeah. Were over allowing people to over leverage. Yes. But you know you're you're. And one of the statements you made is that leverage is a good thing. You want to talk about that? I do, but I think safe leverage, man. I'm not going to sit here and be an advocate of over levering. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I probably meant by that the leverage is better for a private lender on a single family home without a doubt. Yeah. Right. But ultimately, even syndications can be safe with the right operator. So that's the point I'll make, you know, but um, leverage is a good thing. I mean, 
you know, we're in the cash flow business and you can't save your way to riches. Real estate's a phenomenal asset class, whether it be apartments or single family houses, because especially right now, Steve, the interest rates are ridiculously artificially low. It's bonkers. Artificially low. I encourage investors to take advantage of the current leverage available to us without over levering. I'm mm -hmm. I'm not an advocate. You know, I've I've had to lick my wounds, man. I've been upside down yeah, too. You I don't encourage anyone over lever, but I encourage everyone to get as much low interest long-term debt secured against cash flowing assets as you possibly can. And the safest play, the king snake of real estate asset class right now, and it's not even just my opinion, Wall Street Journal just posted on uh, November 10th, you know, rents are going up in single family houses. That's where the big money is going right now. Yeah. Uh, single family starts, new construction starts are up from post pandemic highs. They're, it's up 7%. Right, multifamily starts is down over fifty percent, over forty percent. I don't quote me. I think it's forty-three percent. Okay, but the builders and the big money behind the builders of multifamily—they're pulling out. Well, they're, they're, they're seeing hitting the brakes. The response with COVID, without a doubt, how everyone responded when COVID occurred. Uh, let's see. Um, Tech really appreciates your comment about the the hookers with teeth now. So that Thank is you. plus. Thank so you. So our, our our market is improving <laughs> hey phoenix is where it's at man i drive down the 202 right now i can't even recognize it when yeah. i used to live out here i used to see the asu stadium and, and whatnot i see nothing now it's just no i see buildings you know so uh let's see uh, guys please ask your questions happy happy uh to answer your guys' questions uh so lots of great comments and see uh pace is in the room so that's something i text him the other day yeah uh i think he was in dallas i'm not sure if he's back yet but definitely got to connect you guys. What's cream? That's an interesting. The cream? Yeah. <laughs> well, so the cream started out as uh, we have a local community. Mm -hmm. And shout out to all of my cream uh, members and friends. That's what we are. And the cream started out as the Columbus Real Estate and Money Group. And really, it's just been a group that came together uh, to share resources, specifically with construction. Um, really, that's what it's become, you know? And we've done a great job in, within our local community to weed out the fake gurus and weed out, because no one has time for that. You can find that stuff anywhere you want. So our local community has developed really into sharing resources when it comes to construction. It's really what it's become. It's, it's really an effective tool. We use it all the time for our local community. Um, but then we made it, we took a vote as a group and we decided we're going to keep that group local. So the cream is always going to be where it started, the Columbus Real Estate Money Group. If you're not local, it's don't even apply to get in because we really, really do a good job of, of weeding out. People just don't belong there. Mm -hmm. um, but a lot of people want to get involved with what RJ and I are putting out. We put out videos constantly about raising private capital and doing this stuff. So we have also have a national cream, uh, which is just cash flow, real estate and money. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're all about. So we're all about helping people. Really who we speak to, Steve, is somebody who maybe has a small portfolio. Maybe they got a couple rentals. And RJ and I, through our experience and through the national cream, okay, mm -hmm. cash flow, real estate, money, we have a website, risewiththecream.com. It's under construction. <laughs> um, but... You know, we're, we want to help people take a small portfolio and scale it into a big portfolio. We want to help someone take who has five rentals and scale it up to 50 rentals if that's what they want, because mm -hmm. that's what we've done. So the cream yeah. has two elements, the local element, which will stay local, and then our national brand, if you will, uh, risewiththecream.com is cash flow, real estate, and money. So you mentioned the private money component. Let's talk about the private money component. For I mean, sure. What are you guys doing right now to raise private money? Oh, man. So with experience comes better terms on money mm -hmm. and that's why if you're just getting started you got to pay to play i have some advice for somebody who's just getting in the game um well you know first off you got to pay to play so what if it's expensive don't pay 12 and 2 if it gets you in the game because as you get a credibility behind you as you get a credibility kit if you will the terms of money will go down right um when you're borrowing money you don't necessarily want to borrow money from money people right uh, you know, you come to me for a loan or you come to, you know, half the guys that we hang out with, the terms are going to very be very much be lopsided into our favor because we we do this for a living. Right. right. So and you, we have greater opportunity cost. Absolutely. Big, big time cost. Yeah. Right. 
Um, so you want to work with somebody who maybe has money, especially now with a 401k, you can help people borrow against their 401k with the CARES Act, mm -hmm. um, who doesn't really have the same deal flow or opportunities as the operator does. So you want to work with like corporate Joe or Dr. Susie or somebody who does well, but really wants to be a passive investor. Mm -hmm. Sure, they understand real estate is an opportunity to grow and it's a good opportunity to make money, but they don't want to be an active investor. Um, and then, you know, really, if somebody new can just explain, and this goes back to why I love single family, that their money is secured with a first position note and deed of trust, um, it's really a no-brainer. It's much better than the stock market. Right. I mean, the stock market's going bonkers right now because the Fed is injecting so much trillions of dollars and backstopping the whole thing. That's not sustainable either. It's fun it's to watch. It's not real. It's not real, right? I mean, you could wake up one day and we're at war or something like that, and your 401k turns into a 201k. Mm -hmm. So I believe that, you know, if your listeners and viewers have the opportunity to just educate regular people, not money people, you know, mm -hmm. that their money can be secured and much safer, uh, backed by a real estate asset. The, the demand for real estate is ridiculous right now. And if your viewers and listeners have the ability to find good deals and find off-market opportunities where if they're listening to this podcast, I mean, 80% of the stuff that comes out, and we're probably gonna talk about it today, finding deals. If you have the ability to, to find deals, it's not that difficult to educate someone on why it's a much better play for their liquid capital to be a private lender. It's just about educating people who are not money people. Right, and yeah. a lot of people wanna invest in real estate. Most of them don't know how. Correct. So for them, they'd be happy to work with someone, an operator that knows how, as long as their money is secured. Yeah. Yeah. So what do you guys do right now to find deals in, in Columbus? Find deals. We yeah. got four cold callers mm -hmm. banging the phones. Four uh, amazing four cold callers if they get the opportunity, if they're watching. Um, we're, we're averaging between 10 and 15 leads a day. And we're working three markets. We're working in Columbus, Cincinnati, and Dayton. And you know what we're doing a lot, man? We're wholesaling a lot just to the hedge funds. There's no, no shame in our game. You yeah. know, we tell a lot of people are doing that, right? Because mm -hmm. they pay a premium because Wall Street is gobbling up as much real estate. We're becoming a nation well, exactly of Exactly what you were talking about. Absolutely. Yeah. It's safe for them because mm -hmm. they have free money, basically 1% mm -hmm. money or something like that. They're not too concerned. So we're, we're wholesaling quite a bit to the hedge funds, have relationships with is them. Is it wholesaling or, 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 or wholesaling to them? Whole, or both. double escrow? Mostly wholesaling. Yeah. Yeah, they got it figured out. Because um, over here, they don't want to pay our wholesale fees. I know. Well, there's ways around that too. You yeah. got to figure it out. We're yeah. all smart people here. Yeah. But okay. Um, so well, we, I mean, what do you? Any you advice? can double close it. Yeah. You know, um, there's always way in. If look, here's the thing. Here's the beauty about what's going on in mm -hmm. in our markets. There's more than one. Uh, more than one guy at the show. There's more than one hedge fund buying. So right. if somebody doesn't want to you know, pay wholesale fees. We do have a little bit of leverage now as the operators. And I take the position of defending the operators until yeah. I'm blue in the face. I'm not on their side. Mm -hmm. I want us all making as much money as we possibly can. Right. Um, so we'll pin them against each other and do what you respectfully do that. Mm -hmm. But, you know, if somebody's opposed to you making money, it's probably not the best person you should be doing with. I'd find yeah. other outlets, do what you got to do. You still got to sell um, right. to who is willing to buy. But uh, yeah, explore creative options and doing a double close or something of that nature. But um, yeah, so that's what we do. So we have four cold callers banging the phones, do a little direct mail, do some RVMs. I know everyone's afraid to do RVMs. It's like, look, if the FCC is coming after Dave Perichin, mm. we're the country's going to hell in a handbasket. If you're worried about me, who am I? I'm a nobody, yeah. right? If somebody wants to be removed from the list, remove them from the list. I mean, we so we, we do whatever it takes, man. We bang the phones, uh, we do RVMs, primarily those two. We do mm. some direct mail and a little bit of texting. So how many contracts are you guys doing in a month? We are doing um, probably 10 to 15 a month. Okay, and out of those 10 to 15, let's just call it 10. Sure. Out of those 10, how many are keeping? How many are you dispositioning in other ways? Probably only keeping two. Okay, so you're keeping two. Yeah, it's very hard to hit our buy box with the lack of inventory available. So you, you keep the two, refi it, whatever. Sure, just buy it with private money, we'll get it fixed up and then add it to the portfolio and 
uh, take it in for a burr, you know. Mm -hmm. The lenders on the burr strategy are being more conservative, but we don't care about that because we're not trying to pull out all every dime of equity. That's what gets you in trouble anyway. Yeah. We just want the we want low interest long term debt. So that's a, a very common play for us um, is buying a property with private money fixing it up, getting it rented, and then adding it to a portfolio of other homes that we have private money on yeah. and doing a bulk refi. Right. And then what's happening with the other eight? Uh, well, we are looking at more creative opportunities always, you know, um, but some contracts just go to the wayside and that's mm -hmm. unfortunate. We are exploring ways to turn deals from the trash into cash. Mm -hmm. We don't have a very good strong play at the moment. That's yeah. a, that's a, a hole. But are, are some of these getting wholesaled? Some of these oh, getting wholesaled, hold yeah, for sure. So there's always a few contracts that go to the wayside mm -hmm. if we can't get a better deal. Um, but out of the five, we'll call two keep, uh, wholesale seven, and the rest just we can't do anything with. Got it. Yeah. So you guys are still actively wholesale. Absolutely. Got Absolutely. It. It's Got a great it. time to wholesale, especially selling to the funds and whatnot. Um, cause you know what? You look better in the eyes of the bank anyway when you have a strong cash flow coming in every single month, six figures a month. Yeah. Um, you know, it looks really good for the bank. And if somebody doesn't have a huge portfolio of rentals right now, you need to show that wholesale income or no bank's going to want to talk to you. Right. But the end play is to get as much low interest, long term capital working on the street, pay back our private lenders um, and having a strong wholesale business and having tax returns and, and having a strong P&L from wholesaling uh, will allow you to get better terms on the buy and hold. Right, and so. that's kind of what we had talked about offline is that uh, we all get into wholesaling, again, for the money, but the long-term play sure. is the cash flow. Without a doubt. And so, you know, uh, the the comment that was made before was that, you know, uh, wholesaling is kind of like the hamster wheel, to which I would say if it's a hamster wheel, it's a hamster wheel made in Dubai, where it's gold-plated and it's a gold hamster. <laughs> <laughs> and gold. It's wonderful, isn't and it? It's a glorious yeah. yes. uh, hamster wheel, but at the end of the day, it's still a job. It's still a job because it's not a saleable business. We had talked yeah. about what is a business. Business comes with a book of business, and, mm -hmm. and it's a saleable business. If you own an auto mechanic shop, you have people who've been loyal to you, and they, you know, if you get ready to sell this business, mm -hmm. you sell the book of business along with it. Yeah. In real estate, it's impossible to have a book of business because the people who are buyer or our clients, if you will, in a wholesaling business are the sellers. Yeah. Now, the buyers are not loyal to us. They'll go to the next guy. Of course they will, right? They're investors. But they're investors. So the sellers though, it's pretty much a one trick pony. They're gonna mm -hmm. sell us one house. That's not a book of business. Yeah. We're always finding the next one. Traditionally one off, very, very transactional. Correct. But essential in building the portfolio, I really think that should be a strong focus to all the listeners is use wholesaling as a tool mm -hmm. to help you build something more long term. Absolutely. Uh, so Tyler Smith wants to know right now in this market, is it better to pay, pay down property with the cash flow or save that money and buy more rentals? Buy more rentals because the terms are so low right now. Why, why would, you know, rates are only going up. It's ridiculously it's low. It's ridiculously low. So, you know, you don't, it's good debt. Okay. We've already talked about not getting over leveraged, mm -hmm. but you know, why are you going to pay off 3% money? Not to mention the value of the US dollar inevitably is going to go down with all the money that they're printing. And if somebody, a bank, is willing to give you 30-year money, um, I mean, the dollars that you're paying back this loan 30 years from now, 20 years from now, the whole deal, are worth less in the future than they are now. Why would you use more valuable dollars now to get rid of the debt? Let it go on for as long as you possibly can. Yeah, great, yeah. great point. Um, let's see, what else was there? Um, Dave, Phoenix Fish is Dave. I remember the blue convertible Audi. Who's that? Uh, Phoenix Fish is all it says. Phoenix Fish. Uh, Davis says, uh, Steve needs to do more TikTok or need to do TikTok videos. Go to my TikTok channel, at Steve Trang. I am on TikTok. I am posting videos. Not dancing, though. Come on, brother. You got to step your TikTok game up. The people the people want it. I am, I am I'm, as I'm on TikTok and I'm yeah. watching these instructional videos, I might start pulling some of these dance moves because I'm learning let's how go. to dance on TikTok. Uh, let's see what else is here. Uh, Orlando says preferred strategy. Uh, asked preferred strat marketing strategy. So you already mentioned banging the phone, cold callers, RVM. That's where it's at, and be be relentless. Here's the thing: we can talk about this. I think your viewers and listeners will get a lot of value out of it. Don't expect too much out of your cold callers. Cast a wide net, mm -hmm. meaning let your cold callers dial, and anyone who doesn't say 
go screw off or go to hell go to hell that's a potential lead so now it's got to go over to a more qualified salesperson like mm -hmm. a good old-fashioned american salesperson who knows how to run comps and whatnot i think it trips up a lot of uh wholesalers and investors who they expect too much out of the cold caller. They want them to pull up Zillow comps and do all this. And it sounds good in theory, but just have the guy move on to the next call. Anyone who's not a hell no, um, you gotta send it over to somebody internal, either yourself or your qualified sales manager or sales rep and yeah. let them work it from there instead of trying to have your cold caller do all this craziness. Uh, Daniel Nguyen uh, Daniel wants to Nguyen. see if you can clarify what lo over leveraging is. Over leveraging is the house is worth 60 and you owe 70 on it. You borrow too much. And then a uh, follow up is, would you do a HELOC or a 30 year cash out refi? Both are good and both serve its purpose, but a lot of banks won't do HELOCs right now unless it's an owner occupied property. So, you know, what you gotta watch out for, and I spent all morning negotiating with banks. I got meetings on Monday with different bankers. Um, I like the HELOC play because I know somebody in our group. In fact, I think you were busting my chops online today. It, definitely you, was busting bust, your chops online. You were these. definitely, yeah. <laughs> um, but one of the guys in the group, he made a $300,000 deposit to a local bank and he mm. got a $2 million line of credit at 4.5%. Mm. That is very serviceable. That's very good because you can replace your flip money. If you're paying 10 and 2 right now and you have access to a HELOC, he, you know, it's basically also called a wholesale line of credit that could really cut down your costs. Um, so a HELOC or a, a line of credit, if you use that money to, and you only have to pay for what you are using, that's the benefit of the line of credit. Yeah. But it's gonna save you so much cost of private money. Uh, but the 30 year cash out refi is good too, because if you're refining private debt on something you plan on keeping for a long time and you're paying 10% to your private lender and the bank's going to refi you out at 4% or whatever they give you, that's that's where the refinance comes into play. So there are two tools in the tool basket, you know, or the toolbox then both serve its purpose. So I guess I need to stop busting your chops. Stop, brother. And really- I didn't do anything. Really? Well, I mean, I think I have to, but yeah. uh, but I guess I need to go and figure out who commented about doing two million line of credit with 300. I mean, I, I know who it was. I can do that right now. It's easy. Jeff S. All right. Jeff, Sh 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 Jeff Shadrick. Yeah. my buddy. All right. Well, I'm gonna, Birmingham. I'm going to talk to him. That's um, right. And then do you self-manage? We do, but we actually work in tandem with property management companies. So when you are an operator, we've we've all got to play into our strengths as human beings, right? Um, and we let the property management company, we still pay for their services, not a premium, but we use their entire internal staff for all the bookkeeping and keeping everything good because they have it all set up through Appfolio and whatnot. Mm -hmm. But we still get to dictate and we're in charge of two things that are the most important two things when you're an operator. It's the construction, right? Is if you leave that to a third party property manager, they're gonna they're gonna bleed it. You know, they're gonna yeah. mark it up, and we feel that we can manage construction better than they can. So we take that off of their plate, and we also handle all the tenant placement because one of the most important things when you are building a portfolio, and this is one of the first lessons that we've learned in real estate, is it's all about the setup, right? Mm -hmm. You've got to sit down with the resident of your property, you or a leasing agent or somebody who has a vested interest in this asset. A third party property manager says, sign here, press hard, the last copy is yours, get them mm -hmm. out of the office, right? Yeah. Yeah, man, that doesn't really fly as well as sitting down with the tenant, laying down what the rules are gonna be, mm -hmm. having that conversation, your success rate is drastically going to increase if you get to have that conversation or have a system and process to set the tenant up for success and set this asset up. Your your love or hate of owning properties will be directly proportional to your relationship to how much you love the tenants or how or, or how quality the tenant is. Well, okay. I mean, go ahead. No, I was just going to say a quality tenant, man. I mean, sometimes, uh, you know, Big things come in small packages. What's a quality tenant? Sometimes the one that looks the best on paper is not the best, you know? Yeah. And sometimes the person who doesn't look that great, but they want an opportunity to prove themselves and, and mm -hmm. whatnot. So it's it's very difficult to judge uh, a book by its cover in right. property management, for sure. Yeah, well, we learned that. definitely got some lessons. Lesson so to on answer the now. question, we still utilize third-party property management, but we utilize their accounting systems mm -hmm. more than anything to produce quality reports. 
Um, cause we, that, it saves us from paying a staff member to do it cause they got yeah. it down pat, but we still, and the money collection, we have them because it's a professional office. RJ and I took our business virtual, so we don't have a shiny office, but sometimes when somebody's dropping off several thousand dollars, they want to see a professional establishment. Yeah. Right. So we, we kind of maximize the third party for the money collection and for the leasing paperwork, um, and for the like accounting piece mm -hmm. and we handle the tenant placement and the construction. Got it. Uh, and Joey Ward wants to know if he wants to send a deal to you guys, how would Let's he do go. that? Send it to me. Uh, send it to uh, Walker at sellhousecolumbus.com. He's our acquisitions manager. Perfect. And then TJ Lee wants to know, uh, what do you think about using low or no interest credit cards for buying or rehab? I mean, everything serves its purpose. It depends on the deal, right? Mm -hmm. You know, I'm talking to some guys um, who offer that kind of service. You pay a couple hundred or you pay a thousand dollars up front or whatever, and they're going to get you these lines of credit. I mean, money's a loaded weapon. It's always debt's a loaded weapon, you know? Mm -hmm. So there's always a place for 0% money or anything. It's, it's a deal by deal basis. Just be smart. I mean, if you're getting in the game and let's pretend that, you know, you've got to your private lender will only give you say loan to cost money so let's say they give you 90 percent loan to cost and what that means is you know let's say the arv is 100k and you are all in you're all in for is you know 60k um they're only going to give you 90 percent of what you need mm -hmm. there's going to be skin in the game and sometimes it's very difficult to scale a business if you have to put a down payment on every loan so if you can get that down payment from a zero percent zero percent interest source um, you know, and, and that will allow you to scale to fulfill that void of, of like a down payment. But again, it's all a loaded weapon at the end of the day. You just got to do good deals. Absolutely. Uh, Steve Carlson says he loves your five year mm -hmm. model, uh, model. Uh, are you shifting your business model at all in 2021 or are you just staying the course? We're not doing the five year business model anymore. Everybody, we can't find something to be all in for 25 K. Yeah. So that was a five year am model. And if you're in a lower dollar cost market, smaller city i i encourage you to explore that but right now we're just borrow when we're borrowing private money we're borrowing interest only money so that will allow us to cash flow before we could refi because an amortizing loan is going to be have a higher uh payment because it's p-i-t-i -I, right principal and interest plus the taxes and the insurance an interest only loan there's no principal being paid down so it allows you to keep your payments low um before you go and get the good money which is a refi so we don't do the five-year am deal anymore i wish we still found deals where we could be all in for 25 though yeah but uh, is anything changing at all in 2021 just lower we're getting as much low interest long-term debt on the street as we possibly can yeah that um, seems to be everyone is a big operator everyone's chasing the, the absolutely we and all should. should yeah you and the rates aren't going up anytime soon right um lenders are still lending and i encourage everyone to get this bank money on the street and get it working uh it's going to serve you for many years to come um so nelson castillo wants to know can you talk more about this heloc with the million dollar line of credit was this a heloc attached to a property it sounded like you said you put 300k in the bank and you get proof of heloc it wasn't me it was somebody else it was our yeah. friend but i can tell you i know enough to be dangerous it wasn't me that got this money however i did put it out to a local group that i'm looking for this money now yeah um, so the HELOC, I would assume uh, it is not collateralized. It's probably collateralized against the cash that they made a deposit. So this person put 300K into a local bank, mm -hmm. and then the bank allows them to have this $2 million line of credit. And I would assume that this money, if used for purchasing a flip, the flip is probably going to be collateralized as, as well. well. Yeah. So that's probably how it's set up. It's part of the qualification process. And not to mention, you know, HELOCs are great and they can lower our cost of capital. But remember, a HELOC can be taken away at any time. So going back to the question about... I remember that. You know what I mean? Well, shit, do you remember? <laughs> I'm oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I remember too. I mean, the... the... Yeah, it's Washington Mutual, we're, we're out of business now. It's like, what? I thought I could just keep getting $30,000 checks from you guys. You know? Yeah, it was because uh, Don Costa and I have talked about this uh, in, in other meetings is that we both suffer from PTSD, right? We still, we, we survived so I. the last one. And uh, there are some things that you took for granted. <laughs> Cheap money always being available, running your business on a credit. And that can 
gone in an instant. So they can yeah. take those HELOCs away from us, but that is where uh, a 30 year, 30 year refinance, you know, like a cash out refinance, excuse me, mm -hmm. they can't really take that away from you. Right. No, you they know? can't, it's already tied to the it's asset. It's already tied to the assets. So there's, a, there's room for both. So yeah. uh, before we started, uh, when we were chit chatting, I uh, made a comment that you're in a really good spot in your life, really good mental spot yes what's that about that's awesome i have love in my life i have a, a beautiful better half who's right in the other room mm -hmm. you know and and i'm just happy mm -hmm. i'm i'm genuinely in a space where i mean rj and i've struggled for so long you yeah. know and i see his growth and i see him growing and he's got a beautiful little baby at home and you know now i got uh, an amazing relationship that i'm in and um it's just we're growing up man so it's like the the hustle and the grind is still there we're still very yeah. driven individuals but we're focused more on our happiness and we're creating more opportunities where we can travel come out and do stuff like this yeah. just got done spending you know several days shooting guns with friends in the desert and i love this stuff and you know we missed out on a lot of this stuff because we started in the business so early mm -hmm. and just struggled for so long um and now you know another thing that really delights me is empowering leaders within our team look, somebody said, I'm going to send you a deal. It's not coming to me. You know, mm -hmm. it's coming to someone else because we've built the model. We put the time in, but we also invest in our team and watching their growth and development. It really makes me feel good. Yeah. Um, so that I think all contributes to this state of mind that I'm in. Yeah. So enjoying the fruits of your labor. I'm enjoying the fruits of my labor and I'm, I'm excited to like work with people. I'm excited that my own personal development has reached a whole new level you know, and I've just lost a lot of the ego, you know, that has come. And, you know, quite honestly, I just, you know, basically I'm, I'm totally free. You know, I, I'll tell you, I was taking uh, medication for a long time. Mm -hmm. And in June, I decided I'm like, you know what, I don't need this anymore. And it would made me like a zombie and it created massive mood swings for me. So one day I woke up and that has to do with like my relationship too. It's like, I woke up and I'm like, man, life needs to be better. And it's like, so I am completely free of anything, and I'm just like feeling tapped into the source for whatever that means. Yeah. And uh, a lot of, you know, I'm, I'm no longer suppressing emotions, right? I'm no longer hiding behind a, a crutch or something like that. And uh, it all just leads to more happiness, you know? Yeah. yeah. Uh, do you know what your why is? Well, my why has changed, you know, and I've always struggled with this. And uh, as we get older, you know, um, my better half has an awesome six year old. I love being a dad, you know, and I love being a role model, role model to like the youth, you know, mm -hmm. and like something that completely rips my heart to shreds is hearing about anything with like child abuse or anything like that. Like I'm blessed to have had a great childhood. My parents did their very best. You know, I've pretty much been on my own since I was nine, quite honestly, of just like figuring things out, but it was all out of love. You know, we always had food to eat and, um, you know, I became an uncle when I was nine. So my 16 year old sister had a baby and I was forced to grow up quick and it is what it is. I had a great childhood though. I wouldn't change anything. Not every kid has that opportunity and it just destroys me. Nothing hurts me worse than seeing a child just uh, basically, ch children are innocent, man. Yeah. And there's a lot of crap out there. there and uh, so I think my why, and I just had this conversation with somebody before I came in here is like, man, I would like to give back and create more opportunities for people uh, younger than me. And if I can be a role model or a mentor to not only the six year old at home, um, but to any kid and give them a better opportunity, that's a life worth living. Um, obviously you got the generous genius. Yes. If someone, you know, wants to help support the cause, how could someone do that? I'm pretty sure generousgenius.com or just yeah. contact me direct on Facebook or anything like that. And, you know, we have raised hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, and a lot of that goes to Jason Medley. He's, mm -hmm. you know, the founder and creator of the Collective Genius Mastermind. He deserves all the credit in the world since day one. We've been in CG for six years, but from day one, Generous Genius is his doing. Yeah. It's not mine. All I did was, you know, there was another guy, Matt Andrews, you know, mm -hmm. Matt Andrews, you should have him on the podcast, by the way. Great well, friend. This morning. Did he? Yeah. We were both, yeah. Phenomenal guy. Uh, him, myself, and RJ and Matt, we've traveled to Haiti numerous times together. Mm -hmm. We've traveled to Nepal together um, yeah. and doing different things with the orphanages. And I was in Guatemala uh, last year and just traveling the world and doing these great things. Um, but Matt Andrews was kind of the 
uh, the muscle behind Generous Genius hmm. indirectly. And yeah. then when he uh, exited uh, Collective Genius, I just stepped up and said, hey, Jason, can I help with anything? That's all I do. Yeah. I, it's truly his creation, though. I'm just grateful to be part of it. Uh, what is your superpower? My superpower is diffusing tense situations. And that comes in the form of business negotiations. Um, and even at home and, and personal things, especially with children, mm -hmm. you know, tantrums and things like that. I can snap someone out of a state and calm them down. You know, the child scrapes their arm and they're, mm -hmm. do you have kids? Three. What, what are the age ranges there? Uh, nine, eight, and three. So you know a thing or two. Sometimes, mm -hmm. isn't it funny how a kid could be running and they trip and fall smack on their face. If you act like you didn't even see it, they get right up and keep running, right? That's how they were all, they were all raised that way. They're all that way. It, right. Children are so funny. So I've gained the superpower of being able to diffuse situations, but I do that in my business life too. You yeah. know, um, you've been in many negotiations and whatnot. It's always so tense, right? We all got our ties up so tight and this mm -hmm. and that. I have the ability to loosen everything and talk about serious things with a smile and just a mellow, way of yeah. diffusing situations uh i got my my oldest when she was you know learning how to walk and we were at the mall and she like wiped out at the mall and you know, like banged her elbow right and like all the moms are like freaking out of course and i'm like get up and she just gets up yeah <laughs> right it's magical how that works yeah um so do you think your being class clown has anything to do with the ability to diffuse situation well, I will share this with you. The class clown stuff mm -hmm. was, and this is something that I'm still working on to this day, quite honestly. I told you, I feel that I've pretty much been on my own, well, not on my own, but figuring things out on my own since I was nine. Maturing earlier than everyone else. Yeah, because I had to, you know, like if I wasn't going to go and make new friends, like I, my parents didn't kind of put me, force me into anything like, hey, maybe we should try them in karate or I would have liked that. But it was just it wasn't even on the table. Mm -hmm. I just kind of had to find my own way. And I truly believe the class clown energy that I was doing in that personality was because I wanted attention. Mm -hmm. I didn't get a lot of attention mm -hmm. growing up. I just didn't. Yeah. I remember just, you know, uh, not getting a lot of attention. So, and even to this day, I do a ton of videos and stuff. And this is what I work on with my better half. We all have things we're working on by all means, right? Yeah. And sometimes I take it a little too far, you know? Um, sometimes it's great and it's fun, but Sometimes it's almost this external need for validation. It's mm -hmm. this external need I gotta like be seen, you know? So that's something I'm working on, but I think that's where that came from. Um, it was just needing that attention and reaching, just always reaching out. Everyone look at me, look at me, look at me, which yeah. led into the ego aspect of the whole real estate stuff. I'm gonna be a jerk to everybody and do this all on my own, da da da. So I'm still coming out of it. I'm yeah. 38 years old now and we all got stuff we gotta work on, but I think the first step is just acknowledging it. Ah, you're still young, 38. Thank you, brother. One day. I'm getting know. gray, man. You see this coming in now? I do see that. Yes. <laughs> is there a book you've gifted more than any other? A book that I've gifted mm -hmm. more than any other? I would have to say uh, Traction. I know we're all Traction guys. We all, all do nerds. this. We're all nerds. Yeah. You know? Um, but I think and know moving forward, that's not going to be the continued book that I give. And I'm really more interested in getting in into more spiritual stuff, quite honestly, you know? Yeah. And so I think I, to answer your question, Traction's the, the most gifted book. Do you know what it's going to be? The next book? Mm -hmm. I don't know yet, but yeah. I have a lot of good ones on the, on the palette to, uh, to start digesting more and more. And I just want to continue to work on myself. So... Awesome. That wow. book will change. It's not about the mechanics of running a business. That, that stuff's <laughs> not as exciting to me as what's possible for the future. No, that's not that's that's not what gets you out of bed. No. All right, so I'm gonna make a few quick announcements. Um, think about what you want to leave the listeners with, guys. If you got value today, please like, subscribe, comment, and share. Helps us, helps us all. And don't do it for me. Do it for the algorithm, because that's what they want. Uh, and then we got uh, Ryan Roddy Garchalazo coming from Chicago next week to talk about how to scale the construction side of your business. The guy is uh, the number one consultant for construction. We've worked with him, he's a good guy. Yeah, I vouch for him. Yeah, so he's yeah. gonna be here next week, guys. Check that out. Uh, what are your last thoughts? My last thoughts are, 
have grace to one another, especially when you're building your business, have grace to your vendors, have grace to your partners. Um, it's You're not perfect. It's okay to make mistakes and mm. you are forgiven. Um, I've made a lot of mistakes financially, um, also personally, you know? And if you give your, the most important person to have grace to is yourself, forgive yourself. Uh, we will make mistakes on this journey. There is plenty to go around. I know sometimes it doesn't always feel that way, especially, you know, you're in a competitive real estate market. Mm -hmm. um, but when you are feeling like you are all on your own, uh, try to remember that you're not and you will get bigger if that's what you want. The ultimate goal for all this, Steve, is freedom. I want all of us to be free and personally sovereign. I want you to hold on to more of your money than the US government, either party. All right. They're all crooks. Yeah. So we will be stronger together um, outside of the establishment and uh, forgive yourself, forgive each other, and uh, you do have a voice, don't be afraid to use it, especially if you're complimenting, inspiring, or educating someone else. Awesome, beautiful. Uh, Again, if someone wants to connect with you, how would they do that? So Instagram handle is at the real Dave P. And mm -hmm. RJ is actually probably better at Instagram than mm -hmm. I am. And he is at RJ Papino, P-E-P-I-N-O. And our website, which is under construction, is risewiththecream.com. Who did I tag this morning on Instagram? It was cream something. Or was it? Uh, oh, I don't even know. At the real Dave P, at RJ Papino. That's our personal. It's probably somebody else. It's so, so good. You're busting chops out there. It's not even us. Thank you. <laughs> Whoever's out there. It wouldn't be the first time. <laughs> yeah. I know. You're, in a, you're in an Instagram war with somebody. That we, it's not even me. I don't know. That's good. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Yes, sir. Appreciate this. It was fun. Yeah, man. Thank you guys for watching. See you all next week. Yeah. See, we real estate disruptors. Can't nobody touch us. And yeah, we about to give you game. Shout out to Steve Train. Real estate disruptors. They cannot touch us. And yeah, we about to give you game. Shout out to Steve Train. Jump on the Steve Train. We about to give you game. Yeah. See, we real estate disruptors. 